Hello and welcome everybody here at Exploratorium and also on our YouTube channel uh, watching the live stream um, of tonight's talk. My name is Matthias Maschert and I'm hosting the event which is part of our Denkraum Improvisation, um, translated Thinking Space Improvisation here at Exploratorium. And at the same time, it's part of my still rather new series, Key Concepts. As my guest tonight, I'm very happy to welcome Richard Scott. Great you're here, Richard. Good Thanks evening. for coming. Thank you. Richard has uh, since long wanted to share some of the experiences that he had made with famous drummer and teacher John Stevens. And so it came about that he approached us here with this uh, pro uh, proposal. And we finally came up uh, with a title, which is John Stevens from the Spontaneous Music Ensemble to Search and Reflect. I'm not going to explain anything about this beforehand, but I would like to say just a few words about you, Richard. Uh, ori originally, he's from Britain, um, but he lives in Berlin since uh, quite some time, since around 2008. Many know him as a performer of improvised music, music and as an expert for analog modular synthesizers. He's a very active figure in the scene of improvised music and he's played with many great performers in the field. But he has not only been active as a musician, uh, he's also a writer and researcher in the field of improvisation and avant-garde music. He holds a PhD in sociology, musicology, a higher national diploma in jazz theory and musicianship, a master's degree in electroacoustic composition, and just this year he has finished his second PhD also in composition. Uh, he gained his first PhD in the 80s with a thesis called Noises, Free Music, Improvisation and the Avant-Garde, London 1965 to 1990. Uh, for this, he also interviewed many London uh, musicians and among them there was also John Stevens. And John Stevens has anyway been a very important influence for him, like for many other musicians. Uh, since Richard had himself been visiting his workshops at the time. And all the rest I would leave up to you, Richard. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, the list of qualifications makes it sound like I, I must know what I'm talking about. Um, but of course we're talking about improvisation, so yeah, nobody really knows. Um, Yes, yeah, so I, uh, I was hanging around London in the 80s and I kind of got interested in free improvisation, uh, going to weird concerts in weird places with almost no audience and often very little level of social organisation. Um, it was deeply unpopular form at the time and almost nobody was interested. So it was, it was a weird thing to be interested in. And at some point, uh, John Stevens was running, I think, a week-long workshop in North London. And I was just kind of beginning to play saxophone. So I turned up, and it felt, to me, it felt like a huge risk to actually go to a music workshop, because I didn't really regard myself as a musician at that time. Um, and uh, spending a week with John was just life-changing simple as that. I was completely excited by what he was teaching, by w what he was talking about musically. And I remember on the train uh, coming back at the end of this weekend, just thinking, okay, that's it. That's what I'm going to do for, with my life. Um, and surprisingly, it was. It was. This was a real moment. In moments like that, you never really know if it's real or if you're having some fantasy. But that's what happened. And I don't. I really don't know if I'd be a musician now if I hadn't met John uh, when I did. S um,
the PhD really came, I was going to do a PhD about Yugoslavian uh, Marxist humanism. Um, and I was accepted by the university to do that PhD. And between getting accepted and starting it, I thought, no, I want to do it on improvised music. Um, so I actually came to improvised music from a very political point of view. I'd been involved in left-wing politics, kind of student activism. Um, and something about free improvisation really impressed me, not just musically. In fact, a lot of it, I didn't really understand what was going on musically. I was really fascinated by it socially and politically and philosophically as well. Um, and it took me quite some time to catch up with it musically, to be able to really play on a musical level. So I, I came to it through quite an intellectual level. Um, and I, I don't really see it like that now. I think I've changed my perspectives a lot. But a, a lot of what John was talking about, I really felt I need to think about. I need to spend some years thinking about. So the PhD was kind of based on trying to explore his ideas, trying to understand his ideas. And also speaking to many other improvised, improvising musicians who always disagree with each other about everything. Um, and I was much younger than most of, the, most of these musicians, so I was, I was trying to understand what these people were talking about and why they were always arguing with each other and disagreeing. And, uh, uh, but a lot of it came back to John, that John was the person who strongly positioned an idea of what improvised music was and what it could be. And some musicians agreed with him, some musicians disagreed with him, but this idea was kind of at the center of the scene in London. And I felt that even musicians that didn't agree with his perspectives were somehow measuring themselves by their distance from him. Like, oh, bloody John Stevens talking all this crap. It's, so it, he, he, it's hard, he, was a, he was a pivotal figure and a very strong character. Okay, um, we've got a video of, I thought we'd start with him speaking and uh, uh, hearing a bit of the spontaneous music ensemble playing. Uh, so that's the first piece we have to play. Speaking and... 90% of the music that we're about to play will be spontaneous. And the success of it relies on the unity between the people taking part. For a lot of people, there's difficulties in listening to this music. I think primarily because it's unusual or they've not grown accustomed to the sound of it. The audience should give to the music. Don't expect to just receive. By giving, I mean allow the music to come in naturally. It's not difficult music to listen to, but it can feel difficult to listen to according to how hard you're trying to listen. Don't force it, let yourself be with it and develop with it because it's developing freely. freely. And the most important part about the music is freedom. The first piece that we're going to play, which is an introduction to a piece called Norway, which was composed while we've been here for this week, is called One, Two, Albert Ayla. And for anybody who doesn't know Albert Ayla, he was a tenor saxophone player who was playing very beautiful music that was very much to do with freedom. And in doing so, at the time he was doing it, was in a way very brave and has since died. I mean, I don't know the reasons why or how he died, but he has died. Anyway, this piece, the, the opening part of this piece is dedicated to Albert Isla and it's followed by a piece called Norway.
worked that out, uh, but it's, uh, it's a whole concert. That's uh, John with uh, Trevor Watts, saxophone, uh, Julie Tippett uh, on the voice, and I think Ron Herman uh, on the bass, and that's recorded in Oslo in 1971. Um, I think that still sounds quite amazing now. I can't imagine what that would have sounded like if you'd come across it on Norwegian television in 1971. Um, okay, I'm going to do some... I'm, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to just give some basic background and uh, outline John's influence and activities and then talk about um, his teachings, what he actually taught, what he believed in. And then I'll have a look at one of... Uh, the exercises that he used to work with with musicians. Um, and if we have time, I'm going to talk a little bit about him as a person. So John was a pivotal figure and a visionary figure in the development of both free jazz and free improvisation in Britain as a drummer, band leader, teacher, sometimes a cornetist and vocalist as well. And I think he was an important musical thinker, and this is one reason that I am interested in talking about his work and presenting it to you, because I think his status as a musical thinker hasn't been fully explored yet. He died in uh, 1994, so 26 years ago this month, um, and there still hasn't been a major book about him. I've written a couple of short pieces. Other people have written bits and pieces. Um, but I'm hoping that there would be a book about him one day, either from me or from someone else. Um, but this is really missing at the moment, so this is why I'm very keen on uh, speaking about him. Uh, in 1959, he met Trevor Watts, who we just heard, and trombonist Paul Rutherford uh, serving in the Royal Air Force in Germany, um, part of what was called National Service in those days, which was a very popular way to get a free musical education. Basically, you, you were in the Army or the Air Force, but you got paid and you could study an instrument, learn to read. Um, so it wasn't a bad option for young musicians at that time. So they all did that, and they were hearing uh, American music on the radio here, uh, Albert Eiler, John just mentioned, but also Ornette Coleman, uh, who was just beginning to release records in the late 50s and early 60s, was a huge influence on all of them. Returning to London um, in the 60s, John was a, a rising, a kind of rising star jazz drummer uh, playing at Ronnie Scott's, which is the most important, successful jazz club in London. And yeah, he was making his way, making a career for himself. Um, in the middle of that, around 1965, he, to some extent, turned his back on that and decided to dedicate himself to free improvisation and he formed the Spontaneous Music Ensemble uh, originally with Trevor Watts and they found a club, well it was a, a theatre, I think it was right at the top of a building in the middle of London and it was called the Little Theatre Club and that opened also in 65, um, 66 and they were putting on concerts just about every night and most of the musicians who were, came from the free improvisation scene, also some free jazz musicians, uh, were playing there pretty much every night, often to very small audiences, as in no audience whatsoever sometimes. Um, before my time. In the next three decades, the Spontaneous Music Ensemble's lineup changed a lot. It wasn't really a group, it was more like a family of groups. And what started perhaps as more as a collective group, 
uh, became very much John's, John's group and the forum for him exploring his ideas. Musicians that played with the SME include Evan Parker, Derek Bailey, Paul Rutherford, Kent Carter, Barry Guy, Dave Holland, Kenny Wheeler, Maggie Nichols, Johnny Diani, John Butcher, and quite a lot of other people. Steve Beresford said of SME, very little music I've heard gets close to the strength, bravery, and intelligence of the SME groups. For nearly 30 years, they proved that democracy in music not only works, it produces music of the highest possible quality. It gives me and many others the strength to keep trying. And it makes me laugh a lot too. I think that whole comment I find very interesting. Firstly, it makes him laugh. Um, probably have to ask Steve Beresford why he makes him laugh. But the other words he chooses, strength, bravery, and intelligence, these are perhaps slightly unusual words to use about a group. Um, for the sake of completeness, uh, SME wasn't John's only musical output. He played in a lot of other contexts. Uh, he played with a lot of other groups. I think nearly all of which are really infused with a spirit of openness, free improvisation, and uh, collective interplay. So he had a jazz rock fusion band, uh, a free kind of bebop ensemble, a folk-based group, a large ensemble, and he also played with other. He also played with artists such as Yoko Ono, uh, John McLaughlin, Steve Lacey, Donovan, uh, John Martin, Alan Holdsworth, and many more. He was extremely active. He was extremely energetic, a ball of energy. Uh, so he was really busy all the time doing a lot of different things. He was also painting and drawing. He was kind of obsessed with Samuel Beckett, uh, and he could talk about every kind of music forever. Like, it wasn't just jazz he was into. He, he was obsessed with African music, uh, very into some Japanese music, a lot of different Asian um, kind of more ritual musics like gamelan, stuff like that. And he could also talk about Bill Evans and every jazz drummer who'd ever lived um, forever. He was a fountain of knowledge. And this, and this was also before the time when those things were common. It was much more unusual for people to listen to that stuff and to know about that stuff. He also taught improvisation workshops, a, a role in which he was both brilliant and inspiring. And he helped, also helped found a community music organization. Again, this was kind of way ahead of its time. Um, and the book that we have here, uh, Search and Reflect, was published by that organization, uh, Community Music, it was called. And it's a collection of his exercises that he, that he taught in the workshops. And I'll discuss one of these in a bit more detail later. They're interesting. They're sometimes misunderstood as being compositions or rules, but really they're exercises and ways into improvisation, ways into finding freedom on your instrument. These workshops had hundreds of musicians pass through them, including a lot, a lot of people who went on to develop their own unique music, uh, a, a few here is uh, David Toop, Paul Burwell, Paul Shersmith, and Courtney Pine. Um, but there were many, many musicians went through these workshops. They were sort of training ground uh, for several generations of musicians, especially in London. The work, the, these workshops are also very open to actors, dancers, poets, and non-musicians. And it's worth noting that John was very supportive and encouraging of women being involved. The improvised music scene, people that would perform at that time, 
was mostly male, was very male, and the audiences tend to be male as well. But John was very, uh, very encouraging of, of women, again, at a time before that was really fashionable or before that was something that other musicians cared about or talked about. So, I mean, I think I've already implied this, but I'll say it, I'll say it anyway. Uh, John was charismatic, larger than life, inspired, intense, sincere, uh, very argumentative, and often quite contradictory. He left profound impressions on those who, people who encountered him, and he changed lives and careers. The music of the SME, of all his groups, I think is particularly special. But the reality is it never had much of an audience. Uh, in many ways, it never fitted in with what people wanted or expected from music. Um, but I think more than most music, it directly addresses the question of what music can be, what music could be. I'm, I want to play a couple of early pieces. Um, I think the first one we won't play all the way through, just maybe a few minutes, and the second one uh, might be worth playing all the way through. I'm playing these for a specific reason. The first one is from 1966, from the first Spontaneous Music Ensemble album, which is called Challenge. And this is very much a free jazz record. It's, it's, it's 1966. These musicians are still very much under the thrall of musicians like Ornette Coleman. And they're, it, they're London musicians doing their version of an American music. Um, in the piece from Carrie Obin, which came only two years later, it's very striking. Um, how the rhythm has been opened up, the idea of musical conversation uh, is completely different. So it's worth hearing these two things together, I think, to just emphasize this break. So if we can play the second track. This is called uh, Ed's Message, composition by Trevor Watts. <laughs> Thank you. 
I want to go straight to the next piece. Then Karin Zubin, das nächste. Das nächste Stück. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, that's Carrie Obin, part four. Uh, yeah, I don't know, brought a tear to my eye. That. Uh, to me, that's quite extraordinary music. And uh, 68, it was released about the same time as Peter Brotsman's Machine Gun, which is uh, a German monstrous free jazz classic. And the difference between uh, where the SME were going and where the more expressionistic free jazz was going, I think they're heading in clearly different directions. There's a sort of point of division there around 1968. M Martin Davidson, who uh, runs M&M Records, who released a lot of John's albums, uh, a lot of SME albums, writes, rather than the typical free jazz collective improvisation, in which everybody tries to outplay each other, Stevens decided to go in the opposite direction and create a music in which everybody listened to each other and left space for each other. He also wanted to do away with the jazz hierarchy of front line and rhythm section. And in order to do this, he had to build himself a new, much quieter percussion kit that wouldn't drown out the acoustic stringed instruments the result is a music in which each, contribution, each musician's contribution is not complete in itself, but rather is an essential part of the group whole. Yet each musician's part was distinctive and recognizable as theirs. Uh, that last point is quite important. Sometimes this music is misunderstood as everybody having to do the same thing or everybody not being allowed to express themselves. Uh, I think John's idea was very different from that. I think it was to create a, f a framework where people could be equal, where people could listen to each other in order to be free. Moving on to his teachings, uh, that, takes, that takes us there quite neatly. In an interview I did with him in 1987, John said, that what he believed in was, quote, being in tune as closely as possible with all the people that are around you and at the same time contributing within that, but never contributing to the extent that you couldn't hear what the other people were saying. So nothing you had to say is more important than an awareness of the whole. Evan Parker, um, who was on that last recording and who played with John for his whole life after that, said, I felt a lot of what John was talking about was based on several quite simple rules, which is that if you can't hear somebody else, then you're playing too loud. And if what you are doing does not, at regular intervals, 
make reference to what you are hearing other people do, you might as well not be playing in the group. And so there was a compositional aesthetic which required musicians to work with these two kinds of rules or ideals in mind. So John was arguing for a musician that is for a musicianship that isn't really that isn't really based on virtuosity or showing what you can do, uh, but is based on a quality of listening and a quality of collective awareness. And he would he would go much further and say, it doesn't matter what it sounds like. It's not about what it sounds like. It's about how well you're listening. Um, which is something, I mean, he said that to me uh, over 30 years ago. And I still, I still think about that all the time. Like, how is that true or how true is that? Is that useful? Um, for a musician, to, for someone who spends his whole life dedicated to music saying, it doesn't matter what it sounds like, that's not the point. Uh, it's, quite, it's still quite extraordinary to, extraordinary to me. Because he, uh, for John, music was never just about music. It was about everything. It was this kind of listening that he was trying to develop was a collective spiritual togetherness, an almost meditational depth of focus, and a collective receptive state of being. I think he felt that if he could create that, then the music is just going to happen. The music doesn't need controlling. If you create this context, the music's going to take care of itself. And you don't know what the music's going to be. Within that, you don't know what the music's going to be. Um, another quote from John. Music is a chance for self-development. It is another little life in which it is easier to develop the art of giving, an art which makes you more joyous the more you practice it. The thing that matters most in group music is the relationship between those taking part. The closer the relationship, the greater the spiritual warmth it generates. And if the musicians manage to give wholly to each other and to the situation they were in, then the sound of the music takes care of itself. Good and bad become simply a question of how much the musicians are giving. That is the music's form. Uh, Steve Beresford, quoting Steve Beresford again, he said, Stephen's understanding of the social functions of music is very important, and few have picked up on the implications. And this is something I tried to do in my PhD, and in a subsequent article I've written. Um, it's still something I'm trying to understand. My way of understanding this phrase, music is another little world or another little life, I think he was trying to say it's a, music is a complete world in and of itself, um, but it's not independent of the rest of the world. It's, it's, like, it's, it's a microcosm of society, um, but one in which every kind of social relationship can be expressed and experienced and explored, and in some way, some possibilities between humans can be amplified in music. They can be explored in music in ways that it might be very hard to explore through talking or through other social experiences. Um, so this little world of music is, is still affected by, we're still people uh, it's still affected by the same social, psychological forces that affect us in the bigger world. But it's a more open, more creative space of exploration. And it, it gives us the possibility to be freer from the influence of that bigger world. At least for momentarily, at least for the time of the music's duration.
what impressed me also about many of the concerts that I saw at that time is that unlike a lot of experience I'd had in left-wing meetings and so on, this, this music was not an idea of democracy or collectivism. It offered the possibility of actually experiencing those things in tangible, visceral, real ways. Um, and this can change the world. Big statement. Because this little world is not simply a reflection of the world outside. Because you actually have these experiences in your mind and body and person through music, you have actually had those experiences. And that can change us. That can change our core beliefs, can change how we think, can change how we act. It can change the course of our lives. It definitely changed mine. And in some small ways, it can, perhaps can help change the bigger world. So this is when I say John wasn't just a musician, he was a musical thinker. And I think he was a very advanced musical thinker. I've, haven't, I've rarely come across such clear and powerful philosophical concepts of what art is or what art can do, as I discovered in his teaching. Sociology, I think, is, has begun to catch up with this, but it's taken a few decades for, for sociology of music, for example, to catch up with what John was teaching, with what John knew. Um, I think it's very interesting how far how, how artists can be so much f further ahead than intellectuals. And often it's, it's the intellectual's job to translate the work of artists. And that can take a very long time. That doesn't take one or two years. That can take a lifetime to figure out the consequence of what an artist is doing or saying. So an important thing about John's work is not that he just preached all of this stuff, which he did, um, but he made it happen. The important thing about John's work is that he made it happen. And one, this book, which was written, it's, it's based on his ideas. In some way, I, I find it a strange book because I know uh, it was written with two or three other people who I met at the time and they were very serious about John's work and I think they did a very good job of it. But I don't hear John's voice in this book. I don't hear him speaking, uh, arguing, getting annoyed. Uh, it, it's a very controlled, very cleanly written book that's just about the ideas. But yeah, I don't quite feel him in it. Um, I didn't have any particular reason to say that. It's thrown me off. I want to play a piece that begins to echo, some, I hope, some of what I've just said. Uh, the, the fourth piece is, this is from 1973. It's him and Trevor Watts. At some point, the Spontaneous Music Ensemble was a duet. And this is a piece... Yeah, I'll talk about John's comments about the piece afterwards. Let's, <coughs> let's listen to it first. So that's the fourth piece, please. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, sorry to fade that, but it's quite a long piece. I mean, there's so much going on there. In some way, I, I don't know what, in some ways it's boring, and then amazing things happen, and it's like they've both given up the rhetoric of their instruments. It's not drums and saxophone. It's two people trying to reflect each other's breathing or reflect each other's bodies, uh, trying to find a common phrasing. Uh, it's two people continuously trying to go beyond themselves, beyond what they know, beyond what they think. And the whole album's like that. It's a very unusual record. Um, and it's one of the few where John's exercises are very clearly brought into uh, the composition process. Like it's an album of exercises or it's an album of improvisations that are based on this one exercise. Uh, John said about this in the sleeve notes, face to face means exactly that. When Trevor and I perform it, we are seated to enable the drums and the saxophone to be approximately on the same level. We face each other and play at each other, allowing the music to p take place somewhere in the middle. This is very much an outward process. We're trying to be a total ear to the other player, allowing our own playing to be of secondary importance, apart from something that enables the other player to follow the same process. The main priority being to hear the other player totally. Both players are working at this simultaneously. At this stage, we are not aware of the total sound of the two players. When we arrive at hearing the other player completely and playing almost subconsciously for his sake, we then allow ourselves to bring into focus the duo sound. Up to this point, we've only let our personal playing function in an unconscious way. From then on, we start to converse naturally, retaining the group awareness we've developed. Free improvisation is our aim, and a preparation piece like this is to aid us to achieve the concentration required for the best results. So it's a very clear statement that the, the exercise, the discipline, is a starting point to get you somewhere else. It's not an end in itself. So when, when, when we say John had rules to his music, that's not quite right. Uh, he had ideals, and the rules were there just to create a springboard to, to help, help create those. This particular piece, Face to Face, is a duet, pe duet piece. It was perhaps it's worth reading something from the book. Um, it was developed into a piece called Triangle, which essentially is the same thing, but for three people. Um, I'd, so this is, the, this is the, these are the instructions. And this very much reflected how he would teach it, but it, as I say, it wasn't his voice. Um, and I can't, <laughs> I'm not, certainly not going to try and do his voice. Uh, so stage one, seat three people in an equilateral triangle. Each person focuses their attention on the space between the two others, as if they were listening to the two speakers of a stereo system. As soon as one person begins to play, the other two immediately join in, as if the trio had started at the same time. Each player should use their instrument as a sound source for the other players to listen to. Think of a scribbling sound rather than patterns or sustained notes. And this idea of scribbling is really important to what John taught in his workshops. And it's also part of what he means when it doesn't matter what it sounds like. It's not about playing well. It's about the task. Um, it is fine, for example, to just rub your hands along the strings of a guitar or bass or to breathe down a wind instrument as long as you can be heard by the other two people in the triangle. 
Once you've found an appropriate sound level, keep it. Each person must scribble con continuously with no necess unnecessary gaps in the sound. This ensures that each member of the triangle is always audible to the others. At this stage, each person should be listening only to the other two members of the triangle. Be as detached as possible from what you are playing, focusing only on the other two players. And then, gradually, it goes on, but gradually you allow yourself to become aware of the whole group. Um, but in his teaching, uh, in person, he is very specific that once you find something that you think is good or you start getting into your stuff, stop it. Go back to the beginning. You're serving the other musicians. So for me, this was... A, this created a very precise focus where the moment my ego, I was playing saxophone in those days, the moment my ego thought I was doing something really good, the instruction was to leave that behind. It's, it's, you could almost see this point where you start to cross into something where you want to be good. You want the other musicians to think you're good. You want to be appreciated. You want to think it's worthwhile you're being on the planet because you're so great at playing the saxophone. And, and John just had an instinct for that. And he had an instinct for telling people to shut up when they were doing it because John was a very rude man. And in, in this kind of workshop teaching, he would just, just go, fucking hell, stop it, no, no. And, and, the, and the musician who was nearly always male who was doing that, who was showing their stuff, showing everything they practiced, he, he would absolutely nail them, and he would argue with them. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let it go. Um, so then you'd spend half an afternoon with John arguing with, with half the group. So he was very... It, and that's why... I think that's what I meant when I said his voice is missing from this, because he was a, he was a scrapper. He was a fighter. He was someone who believed in this stuff and was absolutely going to put it out there in the world. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to this. Uh, perhaps I'll come back to that, but I'm going to move on to this last section because I'm already getting into that area. Um, normally, I don't like to discuss an artist's personality too much. I think it can be very detrimental to an understanding of their work. Uh, it's very easy to focus on something that you understand, which is people's behavior. It can be much harder to understand the essence of someone's artistic work. However, with John Stevens, the personality aspect is, is unavoidable. It's part of the story. Because he was larger than life, he was a ball of energy who filled the room, and he was difficult. Um, I think this is a quote from Steve Beresford, that whatever anyone could say about John Stevens, the opposite would also be true. Uh, and he was a contradiction. Despite the sensitivity of his music, he always seemed to be involved in some kind of frustration or battle. He would challenge anyone, he'd get argumentative. There were fallings out, there were fights, sometimes even physical fights. And especially for people who loved and admired him, as I did, he could be an extremely difficult person to be around. Uh, Trevor Watts, who we've heard a lot of this evening, uh, his friend and collaborator for 20 years, said of him, John was always up for a challenge and didn't let basic respect for others get in the way of what he wanted to say. Um, there's no mistaking the, the bitter note to that comment. Um, another close friend said to me, another close friend of John's said to me that uh, John could be, although John could be incredibly generous with other musicians, especially young up and coming musicians, in realizing his musical vision, he could be absolutely brutal, absolutely ruthless with his peers. 
Um, if, if he didn't like what was happening uh, in, on stage at a spontaneous music ensemble concert, he would think nothing of just stopping, stuffing the musicians mid-flow, saying, this isn't working, you're not listening, this is not what the music's supposed to be about. He'd, he'd start giving a lecture halfway through the set to the other musicians, um, which, of course, they didn't really like very much. And he'd also stop the set to have a go at the audience. If he thought they weren't listening, if he thought they were talking, he, he, he'd, he'd give the audience a lecture. Like, you know, what are we here for? What are you here for? You're not doing your role. You're not doing this properly. I mean, it's unbelievable. I don't know any other musician uh, <laughs> that would do that. So he knew what he wanted. Um, and he could be sweet and kind and sensitive and remarkably generous, but he, he also had this very rough edge as well. So the, uh, he could be extremely bossy and controlling, and this is a really interesting thing for a guy who pioneered a whole genre of music that was intended to be leaderless, that was intended to be democratic. So he was almost forcing people into this position of being collective democratic. It's quite a quite a quandary. Uh, Martin Davidson said, uh, he wrote in an appreciation of John Stevens, he also couldn't help but say some more negative things. He was a man of extreme contradictions. He gave an extraordinary amount, but he took a lot too. He could be one of the nicest, most intelligent, most interesting, most inventive people. But he could also, particularly after imbibing, meaning alcohol, be one of the most obnoxious and foolhardy. This dichotomy, combined with his incredible, apparently inexhaustible energy, alienated many people. Just about everybody who became very close to him went on to fall out with him and came back at a slightly further distance. Why did we go back? Because when he was at his best, he was responsible for some of the finest music and the most inspiring th thinking all of which seemed to make it worthwhile. The most important of his extreme contradictions was in his music. As a jazz drummer, he was extremely loud and very interventionist. He was wild. I saw him play jazz gigs, and he was incredibly loud, dominating the room. Incredible thing to witness. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't finish John's quote. Uh, yet he was largely responsible to, for devising the generally quiet and largely egoless music that came to be associated with the spontaneous music ensemble. Um, I've, got a I've, got, I've got too much to say here, actually. Um, I'm just going to wrap up. There's a, I'll tell you what I'm not... Okay, so there's a, there's a whole bunch of really amazing records that I'm, I'm not going to have time to discuss. I've, the, the pieces I picked are not necessarily anywhere near the best pieces. They were more pieces to illustrate particular points. But there's an extraordinary uh, album of duets with uh, John Stevens, Evan Parker. Double album. Uh, there's Quintessence, which is probably if there is such a thing as the best spontaneous music ensemble album, that's probably it. Um, although it doesn't break into any small bits that I could have played you. You really have to listen to the whole thing. Um, yeah, so much other stuff. I'm going to say one last thing, and then uh, I want you to hear John's... Let's listen to John speaking and one piece to finish. So I just wanted to finish by saying that uh, John and the SME, when I knew them uh, in the 80s, were not doing very well. Um, very few people in London were interested in improvised music in any shape or form. And if they were interested in improvised music, they probably weren't interested in the SME. The interest was more ar around musicians such as Evan Parker or Derek Bailey, who were extremely virtuosic, quite extraordinary musicians, um, and had mastered 
new, completely new ways of playing the instrument. Um, and John admired and loved both of them and played with both of them. But he said that, you know, what Evan Parker could do playing solo was amazing, but it wasn't the most important thing about improvised music. It wasn't the most important aspect of improvised music. Um, he really hated the Globe Unity Orchestra uh, for similar reasons, I think. It retained too many individualistic, soloistic, virtuosic ideas of amazing, powerful musicians that were inherited from jazz. And I think that, I think that group sounded to John like a denial of everything that he spent so long working for. But his egoless, collectivist, and utopian concept of group music just wasn't that attractive to many people at that time. Um, it, and it wasn't attractive to many musicians either. It didn't help you to get a gig. It didn't help you to get a career. It didn't help you to build a reputation. It didn't help you to get paid. Um, but the times they did play, the atmosphere was often very odd. With uh, the, 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 the longest running version of the group was with Roger Smith, guitarist, and Nigel Coombs, violinist. And they played extremely quietly. The more in, and it was extremely intense. And the more intense they got, the quieter they got. Very unusual kind of music. Um, and although they played together for many years, they seemed very ill at ease with each other. It was like three men who, he thought, what is this? Who are these people? How, how do they? Um, so it was, it was often really weird and uncomfortable, but it's some of the most intense music that I've ever heard in my life, or will ever hear, I'm sure. Um, Yeah, unfortunately, John didn't live long enough to see a resurgence of his work, or, or of interest in his work. I think, um, I think now uh, a lot more people would, would be interested and would understand what he was trying to do. But unfortunately, he, didn't, he wasn't here long enough to get the benefit of that. But he never let go of his belief in this absolute importance of the music and his visionary image of what it could be. And the not just the possibility, but the necessity of a truly collective music where all our individual identities remain intact but can come together into an organic thinking whole. So for me, this is still a very, very powerful image of music. It's one of the reasons I'm still involved with improvised music and uh, a large part of that inspiration I wouldn't say it came from John, but it's like he, he knew there was a fuse somewhere in me and he, could, he knew how to light that, not just with me, but with many, many other people. So, yeah, I still, I still think of him as my teacher and I, uh, I still miss him very much. I wish he was here. It'd be great to discuss this stuff with him. Uh, anyway, yeah, let's, let's play this. We okay for time? It's not, it's, there's two, there's, there's two bits of him talking and there's a final piece which I think, I think expresses I don't want to bring too many concepts into it but the, when you let go of your individual line, when you let go of your individual identity, there's a sort of It's like you let go of the story. The story is a line that travels through time. If you let go of that, it, you don't. It, it's like you can break the music down to not just single words, but actually syllables. And syllables don't mean anything. And I think this is one of John's ideas: was to break pieces of music to this atomic level, which is a word that Evan Parker uses. So you're dealing with atoms or molecules of sound. You're not necessarily dealing with full phrases or full statements. And these molecules 
can come together and create musical structures. And I think this is partly my way of understanding what he was talking about. So this, the, the final piece we're going to play is With Hindsight, which was recorded um, with John Butcher and Roger Smith in 1994, a few, few months before John died. Uh, so it was probably his final recording. Uh, but he also makes some comments um, about the piece as well. So if we can play tracks five, six, and seven continuously, um, and then we'll go to track nine to finally finish. So five, six, seven, nine, all in a row? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the best. Yeah, that's a good way of doing it. Dann geht zwischendurch einfach immer kurz auf empty und dann ist klar eine Pause. And you indicate when the piece is finished, when it's not clear. Is it it's clear. Um, playlist number five. Yeah, with hindsight. You start with John's comments. Yeah, five, six, klar? seven. Okay. Quite often when we function as human beings, or at least I find this, that I might be walking down the street and not only am I not looking at anybody else, my brain is taken me from one end of the street to the other. So that is very limited vision. What we're dealing with in the piece is what I call oral vision because it's music. And the idea there is that two people within the four will be face to face and actually concentrating on each other, i.e. sort of playing some sort of a duet. And at the same time, there are two other people doing the same thing. Now, these two other people are within the peripheral vision because we've centred our sight on the person opposite us. Now, the other side to this is that we need to keep our peripheral vision in sight because when one person stops, everybody stops. For me personally, what I'm pleased about is the fact that it's still continuing the nature of doing that or the concept of doing that, meaning interaction as a priority. But my actual situation now is not that much different to what it was in the past. So that I suppose what I'm saying is the relationship between the public and the media to this music is still pretty much the same as it was in the 60s, except that in the 60s, there were people like Victor Schoenfeld, for instance, prepared to say 
this is the most significant music since Louis Armstrong's Hot Fives, which I very much doubt would happen now, though I feel this music is as contemporary now as it's ever been and as relevant. If anything, I'd see it more clearly in terms of its relevance, though in the 60s I had a passion for the nature of what this is to the degree where I thought, well, if this music or this activity was accepted and taken seriously and even enjoyed by people, it meant that society had improved a bit. Well, as it's happened, the direction that society's gone in still requires the nature of this music as an alternative to divide and rule individualistic things above community things. The thing is, within the 60s, playing this music, it wasn't in that different a place to the place it's in now. There were very few invitations. In fact, people would react aggressively towards it with threats because they were offended by the nature of it. Well, that doesn't happen now. It's just that now there's been a long period where, at least from my point of view, it seemed to be ignored. So the other side of it is that within that period, the glorious 60s, if you like, because definitely there was far more optimism and there was a feeling of equal opportunities was gradually developing, which, as we've seen, has now been dissected and yeah. destroyed. I did make a decision that I'm going to get on with this in the way that I believe in getting on with this. And hopefully, in the end, it will arrive at something that's of some value. And also, I will have found out something about the joy that's in making music. The joy that was in making music, right? <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard, for your really deep insights and experiences and for sharing all this with us here. Um, I don't really know if uh, I want to start asking more questions now. I would uh, like, since there's also some audience here in the room, um, I would simply ask if you have questions to Richard, um, maybe you can ask not so long questions, then I will repeat them also for the live stream audience, um, if there are any. Can you uh, ask, uh, can you answer directly, maybe? <laughs> I think, I'm, I, I mean, John's talking a lot about the 60s. Um, and I think part of it is just a social change. That there's a whole, I mean, one of the things I didn't talk about is a whole sociological side to this, that John, Trevor, 
Evan, Derek Bailey, Maggie Nichols, most of the others, these are working class people. These are not people that were supposed to be musicians. They weren't people who would have had the chance to have been musicians before the 1960s, before the 1950s, 1960s. Um, because, you know, society and economy were opening up in, in, the way, in the ways that they did in the 60s, th these new possibilities happened, and it seemed like this was going to be the future. You know, it seemed like the world was going to get better, that people with less money and less background were going to be able to have choices. Um, and I think John's generation, really not just improvising musicians, but in theatre and dance and lots of other kinds of music, they grabbed the chance, you know, wow, we can go to school, we can go to university, we can learn to do something, we can be musicians, we can be artists. It's not just for the social elite. And I think when that spirit of optimism went away, I think it became much harder for musicians to take on ideas like that. I think John's ideas are radical and they the the sort of there's a sort of brutal truth that it didn't help him much to get a career and stuff because he wasn't advertising himself as a genius drummer. He wasn't trying to I mean he was a great drummer, but he wasn't that wasn't the thing that interested him. That wasn't what was important. That wasn't what he talked about. Um, but I think for young musicians coming up, it's like, well, yeah, egoless playing where nobody even notices you're there. It doesn't fit the economic model. It, and it doesn't fit the, the move to the right that the whole of society and economy has had. Uh, since the more experimental days. So I think that's part of it. It's a sort of ugly answer, but I think that's part of it. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's harder to support this kind of open-hearted approach to music making if you don't know where your next falafel is coming from or something like that. Um, but there's also another answer, which is weirdly related to Berlin, which is that actually a lot of what happened in Berlin uh, after 2000, uh, a lot of musicians here and in other places really turned their back on this virtuosic free jazz um, way of playing, which I'm not totally opposed to, by the way. That can be fantastic. Um, and John used also used to play in that context, but uh, there was a movement towards a much more reductionist way of playing here, people playing more minimal, much more egoless way of playing. And I think a lot of those players were not in, influenced by John Stevens and didn't really know much about him. Uh, they probably didn't like what they knew about him. But he was involved in this, you know, really reductionist, egoless way of playing, also playing very quietly um, in the duet with Trevor Watts in 1972-73. They were already exploring that then. So I think some of the ideas have come back, um, but not at all in the same form, or not they're not playing that kind of music. Um, and I think John would have loved that as well. I think he would have loved this quiet music. Um, and I think he would have felt an affinity with it himself. So I think it does come back, but it's... I, I mean, John felt disappointed that he spent 30 years shouting about this. And as Steve Beresford said, it, we know it works, but it's still a very hard thing for musicians to really embrace and dedicate themselves to.
I think it. I think it was both. Um, I f I feel like he was with the more social ideas, or uh, like he he says that music's a way of self improvement and these kind of ideas. I think he's just trying to look at the core of it. I think he is absolutely a music lover. Anyway, regardless of all of that. But I think he, yeah, I think he just looked and, and, and was thinking, what's at the center of this? Why does this work? Why does the Bill Evans trio sound so amazing? And part of it's music, but part of it's this spiritual ability uh, that the music is kind of witnessing. So I think it's always completely connected. I mean, he wasn't, yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't really going around saying music makes you better or music's going to heal you, even though that's a kind of implication of it. Ah, okay. Yeah. What many gave us. Yeah. So um, hope it's not lost. But Maggie Nichols is very much. I mean, she met John when she was very young, and she took John's stuff on board, and she's carrying on with it. She's still teaching that. I I did some workshops with her years ago. It was quite amazing. It was a mixture of John's search and reflect material and kind of anarchist encounter group yeah, was com <laughs> was completely yeah. Yeah. was completely bewildering but i it, i mean everyone was just joyously happy at the end but uh, yeah and she's a fantastic musician as well yeah i'm i'm glad you brought maggie up i, I sh yeah i should have mentioned her a bit more So do you think that workshops still have the same uh, impact today? Like, I, I mean, you said there are hundreds of musicians who went through the workshops of John Stevens. And um, is it still that common? No. I mean, but today they can uh, study <laughs> improvisation and yeah, I, art I, at I, universities. That's such a weird context, because in those days, John's workshops and then later Maggie's workshops, they were the only things you could do. There was no possibility of improvisation being taken seriously in a conservatory or, or university. So, and, and, and of course being taught improvisation in a university is a really weird thing. Like, like if it's handed to you from above, so to speak, mm. it's a completely different thing from deciding to spend a week in a workshop with this crazy guy. I mean, it's, um, those workshops were very underground, were very informal. They weren't, it wasn't teaching. It was, yeah, it was really an experience. So I can't really imagine how that compares. Um, I think it would be good if musicians did more workshops 
I feel a bit of a responsibility to do it myself, although I never have in Berlin. I used to teach workshops in London. Um, for me, it's difficult because I'm working so much with electronics now. I don't know how all that fits in with these kind of ideas. But, yeah, I don't really know the answer to that. I, I think um, I'm surprised... Also, a lot of John's ideas, I mean, Maggie, doing a workshop with Maggie would be much better than doing a workshop based on this book because she's in the bloodline, she knows it. <laughs> um, and it, that's a completely different feeling, someone who's absorbed it and could be spontaneous with it. And the book is great, but it's not, it's not the same energy, it's not the same, uh, not the same thing. So. Yeah, I didn't really answer your question because I don't really know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the reason why I was asking um, is maybe that um, I was thinking about how to place the talk. Uh, there's the series, which is more a kind of portrait of artists, portrait of scenes and whatever, uh, which is more historiographic, ethnographic oriented. And the key concept series is uh, the idea that it's more of a systematic approach to general um, theories or general uh, important characteristics of improvisation or whatever. So the idea here was really uh, also to focus on the workshop idea and um, if you w translate workshop into the whole spirit uh, that John brought into the music, so this idea of total collectivity, mm -hmm. cosmic uh, connectivity and all these kinds of um, creating a, an atmosphere and then when you manage um, to create this kind of atmosphere, the music will kind of come from itself. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is uh, really essential to bring people together and trying to create this atmosphere that the music can grow from it, kind of. Mm. And um, in my point of view, I mean, this doesn't necessarily have to be a workshop, it can also be people simply joining together for a group. That's also interesting, maybe. I mean, um, have all those groups formed uh, in workshops, famous groups, or uh, how, did, how did they come together? I mean, was the music uh, workshop first, or was there first the spontaneous music ensemble, for example? Well, like the answer, maybe. This, well, both. This, the, the first spontaneous music ensemble was definitely just musicians coming together. And I think John got a lot of ideas from that. And there's, I mean, some of the ideas he talked about were not just his own. They were definitely developed along with Trevor Watts, along with Evan Parker, Paul Rutherford. And at some point he decided to teach them. And in, in he, the, the way he put it is that like Derek Bailey, Evan Parker were becoming stars playing all over the world and they didn't even want to do SME anymore. It was like they, they'd had enough of it. They had enough of him telling them what to do. So he started teaching. He put these workshops together. And then the, the, the later SME uh, with Roger Smith and Nigel Coombs, uh, all those people were people who attended his workshops. So the, the later SME came directly out of the workshops. Mm, yeah, um, yeah. I, for, for me, I, when I went to it, I wasn't an experienced musician. So for me, the workshops were like a, a portal into another world where you could play. I mean, there's some really extra, I heard some really extraordinary music in those workshops. Um, but it was dependent on not just we're all exploring something together, but John had an idea. There was always a sort of strong idea as to, as to what you were doing. So you're encouraged to explore and be open and, and do lots of different things, but you always knew what you were doing. You always knew what you were trying to do. And this kind of, in a way, it was all hippy-dippy stuff. But in another way, you've got this bloke kind of shouting at you if you're not listening to him. So it, it, for me, it was a really weird combination. 
Uh, but for me, it really worked because uh, I, I was inexperienced. I wanted someone to... There's a phrase like, hold the space. Like, John was someone who held the space, not just for the workshops, but in a way for the whole scene. Um, he had that charisma and fearlessness to say, let's do this. And, uh, I, yeah, so I think... I kind of think that's that's needed. And in a way, it maybe is a contradiction of this whole leaderless idea that, yeah, it, it should be leaderless, it should be open, but there's points where people have to take responsibility. And it doesn't need to be the same person, but, you know, musicians have to take responsibility. Somebody has to make it happen. And I don't just mean by talking, I mean musically as well. This is Evan Parker. I had a conversation with him a long time ago. And I remember him saying that you don't always have the, the idea every night. Sometimes somebody else has the idea. And as an improviser, one of the skills to learn is to follow the person who has the best idea and to know when it's not you. Um, and I, th I think this is a... This is a I think it's an interesting idea that I'm still playing with. Also personally, like some nights I'm playing with a group and I know that I kind of, I, I kind of know I'm on it. I have a sequence of ideas that seem to work and that other people seem to pick up. Other nights, yeah, I, I'm waiting for other people. I'm looking for ideas. I'm trying to respond to what other people are doing more. And there's a, there's a slightly mysterious attitude to that so some nights you've got it some nights you haven't and but you hope somebody else has uh, so I think teaching and workshops could also be I don't know related to that in some way any more remarks or questions Yeah. And how would you suggest? Because I think this is very important. The, 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 the concepts are very important. And these are concepts that maybe the AACM, yes, use the same ideas or similar things. I think, I think the AACM is by far the most closest. Clo closest. And, and they were not aware of each other at, no, all, no, not at all at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this was it's hidden somehow. Yeah, somebody needs to document it much much better. Uh, um, there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that happened. And many of the people who are involved have already died. Right. And the ones who are still around are not young, shall we say. So it, it, it really feels like it's a bit of history that's in danger of, uh, of disappearing. And, um, yeah, that really shouldn't happen. I, I, I hope there's a possibility to... I mean, a book's just a book. But at least uh, if, if, if these, this, these stories, these ideas, this knowledge was brought together in one place, I think it would be filling in something for the, for the future that people could look back on it, uh, be inspired by it a bit more easily. So I, I would really like that to happen. Part of why it hasn't is the usual thing. It's England. There's no money for arts. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody gave a shit about what John was doing in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s. 
and nobody ever put any money into it. It's the same with many things, EMS synthesizers, uh, you know, amazing English company, so creative, amazing what they did. There's one tiny documentary online, like a half hour documentary about that company made by an Australian broadcasting company. Um, so I'm afraid just anything related to art and culture in Britain is just lucky if it survives and lucky if anyone remembers it. So I think that's the real reason. If this had happened in a, uh, another country in Europe, I think it's much more likely that people would have said, God, this is, this is our legacy, this is our heritage, this is something to be proud of, something to remember. I mean, Evan, someone like Evan Parker, I think in many other countries would have a professorship or something, or <laughs> OBE or something. But it's like, yeah, he's some saxophone player doing weird stuff. We don't care. Yeah, that's a depressing place to end on. <laughs> God. Well, we're talking about literature. I mean, there has been at least a little bit of uh, documentation uh, by Richard. I mean, there's the interview with John Stevens on Richard's uh, internet page. And there's also a lot of uh, other interviews also with amazing musicians from the time. So it's really um, worth having a look into this. Um, and there's one article written by Richard also in this book, Sound Weaving, oh. Writings and Improvisation, edited by, by Franziska Schröder and Michael O. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the name. Michael O. Haoda. <laughs> and... Um, so some of the things that Richard was talking about are in this ar article as well. And uh, there's a whole more of analysis and going through different um, music analysts um, of the records and of the different players. So that's also really interesting to read. It's, very, it's almost impossible to find this book. I don't even have a copy myself. So uh, I, I'm so happy to send a PDF to anyone who's interested in that article. Yeah, so you can talk to Richard afterwards. Uh, we also have a library here at Exploratorium. We have it available even twice. <laughs> so uh, it's also possible to get it from here. Um, I have always been really interested and attracted in this early time of English improvised music. So I'm really happy that Richard came here and told us all this about John Stevens and uh, the whole context of the time. Thank you very much again for coming. Thank oh, you welcome. also for coming. Thank you. Um, for the live stream audience, we had to deal with some time shifts between the live and the live stream. I hope it was okay. Um, I hope to see you again here in the Denkraum Improvisation at Exploratorium Berlin. There are more nice events to come. Uh, just follow our program. And thanks a lot again. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.